Hello, and welcome to this on-demand session on building emotional intelligence for career and life success. My name is Kaylin Guiley, and I'm the ASME Senior Vice President for Public Affairs and Outreach. That's a volunteer role in which I lead the ASME sector that includes engineering education, K-12 STEM, government relations, and engineering for global development. The Industry Advisory Board and the Diversity and Inclusion Strategy Committee both act as a part of the public affairs and outreach sector, but actually report directly to the Board of Governors. In my day job, I work for the Boeing Company as the Senior Manager for Global System Safety. I've been at Boeing for about 16 years and have held a variety of roles, mostly focused on design, safety, and certification of aircraft systems. But today, I'm excited to talk with you about a topic that I'm very passionate about, uh, one that I think has contributed greatly to the success I've had so far at Boeing and at ASME, and one to which I recommit myself to continue to develop every day. Uh, we'll talk about what emotional intelligence is, we'll talk about why it's important, and we'll review a couple of tools that you can use to exercise and develop your own emotional intelligence every day. But first, let's talk about why you should care. Uh, most of you watching this are probably students, and you may carry an explicit or implicit belief that you're just about done developing as engineers, that by the time you graduate, you'll have the skills you need to be successful for the rest of your career. The truth is that that's not entirely accurate. You will spend the rest of your lives either growing as engineers and as individuals or being left behind by your peers. Uh, you may have heard some people say that change is really the only constant in life, but really that's not true. The graphs on this slide represent uh, the number of patent applications filed with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the annual merger and, activity, merger and acquisition activity globally, measured in billions of U.S. dollars, and the total number of stock shares traded on the New York Stock Exchange in thousands. So these are all measures of change in the world, and regardless of what measure you choose, the conclusion is really clear. Change isn't just constant, it's actually accelerating exponentially. Most of you students will probably graduate between 2021 and 2024, and many of you will likely be in your early 20s when you graduate. So if you plan on working until you're 65 years old, that means you'll spend about 43 years in the workforce. And 43 years ago was 1977. So just as a point of reference, the Apple Macintosh computer went on the market, became commercially available in 1984. Uh, when you retire, it'll be the mid-2060s. So just imagine the amount of change you'll see over the course of your professional careers and how important it will be to continue to grow throughout your careers to adapt to that change and to continue to be successful. As an example from my career, uh, when I came to work at Boeing after earning my mechanical engineering degree, I figured out pretty quickly that I needed a skill set in the area of project management and I enrolled in a program through Villanova University to earn a master's certificate in applied project management. A few years after that, as it became clear to me that I wanted to move in the management direction with my career, I went back to school at the University of Washington and earned a technology management MBA. And then more recently, in 2018, I was asked to take on a special assignment uh, implementing an innovation cell, launching an innovation cell supporting the 787 final assembly line here in Everett, Washington. And a big part of the operating model for the innovation cells is using additive manufacturing to quickly solve problems on the factory floor. Uh, so for me, you know, this might not seem like a huge deal to many of you. Many of you grew up with additive manufacturing. Maybe you had 3D printers in your high school or college classrooms. Uh, but for me, when I was growing up, uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, was still the stuff of science fiction. Um, so it wasn't a skill set I had. And uh, so I enrolled back at MIT through their edX platform online uh, to learn more about the fundamentals of additive manufacturing as well as their applications. Um, so I, I think... You know, the point is that uh, this was a set of skills and knowledge that I didn't have when I graduated from engineering school that I needed to be successful in that assignment. And I think you'll encounter many of these throughout the course of your careers. Um, so you've taken a good first step demonstrating your commitment to your own development by being here today, participating in the eFest Careers event, and watching this video. Uh, but that ongoing envelop development will continue to be important and arguably will only get more important throughout the course of your careers. So let's shift gears a little bit and get into the core subject matter here, which is emotional intelligence. So you would be forgiven for not immediately recognizing this picture. This is a picture of Viktor Frankl when he was a younger man. Uh, if you don't know who Viktor Frankl was, he was an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist um, who, during the rise of the Third Reich, was taken into custody and placed in a concentration camp. Now thankfully, he survived the Holocaust and he actually had some transformational experiences in the concentration camp he began to realize that he was actually, in a sense, 
more free than the guards who were holding him captive, because the guards were simply following orders, so they were receiving stimuli and they were immediately responding, whereas he was exercising his own freedom of thought to interpret the stimuli that he was receiving and to choose how he interpreted them and to choose his response. And coming out of the concentration camp, thankfully as a survivor of the Holocaust, he went on to write a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which I highly encourage you to read. And one of the quotes from that book is, he says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lies our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And that to me really is the underpinning of emotional intelligence. It's all about taking that space between stimulus and response and drawing that space out as much as you can to recognize the stimulus, recognize the impact that it's having on you, the emotional response you're having to it, and then choose a different response that is most likely to achieve the desired outcome in that situation. So it's not at all uncommon to hear people when you start talking about emotional intelligence say, I don't need emotional intelligence, I don't let my emotions get in the way in my work or in my decisions. But that's really not how it works. Your emotions do exist and they do influence your behavior. And emotional intelligence is about understanding that, recognizing that, acknowledging that your uh, behavior and that your uh, thoughts are influenced by your emotional responses, and then choosing how to manage those. Uh, there's been a lot of neurological research on decision making in the last couple decades that suggests that we actually make decisions well before we're consciously aware of having made those decisions. Uh, that research seems to suggest that the process that we interpret as decision making in our minds is actually the process of rationally justifying decisions that we've already made emotionally. And in some ways this builds on research all the way back to Phineas Gage, who was a railroad construction foreman who in 1848 uh, had a large metal rod called a tamping iron that was inadvertently propelled by an explosion up through his left cheek and out the top of his head and in the process it severed the hemispheres between his left and right brain, severed the connection between his left and right hemispheres of his brain and miraculously he survived um, and some of the changes that we saw or that uh, people at the time saw in Phineas Gage inspired ongoing research in the 1960s uh, by a professor named Roger Sperry at Caltech uh, who worked with individuals with split brain syndrome. So this was a, a syndrome that occurred um, when, as a treatment for epilepsy, the connections between the left and right brain were actually surgically severed. And uh, when he worked with these patients, Dr. Sperry would be able to communicate directly with one or the other hemisphere of the brain by giving signals to just one eye. So by holding up a sign with an a image of a hand waving to just the left eye, Dr. Sperry was able to communicate with the right brain and the subject of the experiment would often wave back, um, being able to, you know, the right brain being able to see this waving uh, stimulus and would respond to that stimulus. Then uh, Dr. Uh, Sperry would ask them why they waved and the left brain, which controls the processing of language, would respond, oh, I thought I saw somebody I knew. So this process isn't nearly as disjointed um, in those of us who have normal, typical connections between our left and right hemispheres of our brain. It's a much more integrated process. But what the research suggests is that often we're reacting emotionally to stimuli, and we spend a lot of time with our left brain sort of rationally explaining the reactions that we're having uh, to stimuli and creating a coherent narrative that allows us to feel like we're in control. Now, emotional intelligence at its root is about understanding all of this, um, at, at least at a superficial level and about, as we said before, drawing out that space between stimulus and response to give yourself time to acknowledge those emotions, to acknowledge how they may be affecting your decision making, and to choose a response that's most likely to achieve your desired outcome. The definitive work uh, introducing emotional intelligence from 1990 defined it as the subset of social intelligence that involves the ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings and emotions to discriminate among them, and to use this information to guide one's thinkings, thinking and actions. Now, earlier I made the case that you will need to grow throughout your careers, um, and now uh, I want to get down to the case for emotional intelligence specifically. So most of you, as you're embarking in your careers, presumably are hoping to have some degree of professional success. And what you'll find as you get into your careers, and may have already found through your schooling, is that this is all about relationships. And when you're in the workplace, particularly if you assume a leadership role, people are always watching. And I really mean always. 
Uh, one of the most tangible examples of this for me was a uh, leader that I interacted with at Boeing Portland uh, who told me that he had been approached by one of his employees who had seen him at a motorcycle rally and was chastising him for having been riding his motorcycle without a helmet. Uh, so this is a really clear example that as a leader, as somebody who has a presence in the workplace uh, that's recognized by others, everybody around you is always watching your behavior and they're always interpreting your behavior and creating uh, their own cohesive narratives, their own judgments around that. And you can't always control what they think. Uh, so you may have heard people say that nobody sees the world as it is, everybody sees the world as they are, and there's really a lot of truth to that. So that may all sound like bad news, but here's the good news. You can't control their filters, value systems, and beliefs that they use to interpret what they observe of your actions and the conclusions that they draw about them, but you can better understand those filters, value systems, and beliefs, and you can adjust your behavior to achieve better outcomes. And that process, as I've already said, is called emotional intelligence, and it really does work. A study by Talent Smart found that emotional intelligence plays the biggest role in performance when compared to 33 other workplace skills. They found that emotional intelligence influences 58% of success across every type of job. So that includes engineering, but it also includes many of the other career paths you may find yourself drawn into. Of all the people they studied uh, through this study, they found that 90% of the top performers also demonstrated high emotional intelligence. On the flip side, they only observed high emotional intelligence in 20% of the bottom performers. So emotional intelligence really is a predictor of high performance. Now 90% tells you that it is possible to be a top performer without emotional intelligence. 10% of the top performers apparently don't score high in emotional intelligence. But it's unlikely that you're going to be in that 10%. Emotional intelligence is a good path to being a top performer in your professional career. And unlike my additive manufacturing knowledge I talked about earlier, all indications are that emotional intelligence will continue to be relevant throughout the remainder of your career. So automation will likely change the nature of work, it'll change the future of work, and it's likely to create significant change in the time that you're in the workforce. But unlike most of the technical knowledge you're gaining right now, and by the way, I don't say any of this to minimize the technical education you're getting. Much of what you're learning through your engineering education is how to learn about technical topics and how to absorb that information and process that information and apply that information. But, uh, so I don't say that to, to disparage engineering education. However, unlike most of the technical knowledge that you're actually absorbing right now, emotional intelligence is a skill set that you will be able to continue to build and build on through the rest of your career. And it's not just about professional success. So in the title I said career and life success, and that wasn't a mistake. Um, you know, professional success in the sense of promotions and raises is great, but this is also about enjoying your job, and it's about building the life you want and the relationships you want outside of work. So Simon Sinek, a business thought leader, says, everything you want you can have instantaneously, except job satisfaction and strength of relationships. There ain't no app for that. Some things that really, really matter, like love or job fulfillment or joy or love of life, self-confidence, a skill set, all of these things take time. Uh, you can actually find this in an interview segment on YouTube under the title, The Millennial Question. And emotional intelligence can help you develop all of these things, as we'll discuss further in the rest of this presentation. So let's get into the nuts and bolts here. We can make emotional intelligence a little more approachable by breaking it into four disciplines that all build on each other. So starting in the upper left-hand corner of this figure, you see in the self column, in the recognition row, self-awareness. So this is really what we talked about, about drawing out that space between stimulus and response so that you have an opportunity to develop that awareness that doesn't necessarily exist. So you're often or always potentially having emotional reactions to the stimulus around you. Self-awareness is about understanding those emotional reactions and taking the time to observe and acknowledge and accept them. You can either move across the table from the self to the social column where you start looking at how you apply your own knowledge of yourself, your own observations about the emotional responses you have to situations, and then try to put yourself in other people's shoes through a process that you might hear referred to as empathy, uh, but that's headed here by the title social awareness, where you really look at not just understanding how you might respond, but beginning to predict and understand how other people might emotionally respond to the stimuli they're receiving. 
From self-recognition, you can also move down the table into the regulation column, where you start looking at not just understanding the emotional reactions you're having, but looking at how you might choose a different response. So once again, acknowledging that emotional reaction, recognizing how it might be motivating you, but then also choosing how to control that emotion and how to control your actions that might otherwise be reflexively based on that emotion in order to achieve a better outcome. And from both social awareness and self-management, you can begin to combine those skills to think not just about your own emotions and the emotions of others and how you might manage your own emotions, but also how you manage emotional situations that might have broader impact on other people. So recognizing the emotional reactions that they might have, but beyond recognizing them, taking steps to maybe change the stimuli that might inspire specific emotional reactions that might have adverse outcomes for you, or helping others to understand uh, their emotional reactions in a way that is non-threatening, and helping them to choose courses of action that will achieve the best desired outcome for the whole team. Now let's take a look at a couple of specific tools and frameworks that you can use to build on your emotional intelligence. Uh, the first one I show here is the Ladder of Inference, which is a framework that helps us understand and analyze the filters, values, and beliefs that we discussed earlier and that we all have and apply to interpret the world around us. So let's take a look at an example of how this might work. Let's say I was giving this talk live and I'm scanning across the audience and the vast majority of the people I'm seeing look like they're smiling faces, they're engaged, they're paying attention, they're enjoying the talk. But then my gaze as I gaze across the audience here lands on one individual who's yawning, right? Now my observable data and experiences include all of the people I've just looked at in this audience, but I might select data based on those observations and the data I select might be based on some internal frame I already have. So let's say I have some implicit fear that maybe I'm not gonna do a great job delivering this presentation. The piece of data that I then fixate on is that one individual that I saw yawning. And once I've fixated on that piece of data, I begin to add meanings to the data I've observed. So it's not just that that individual is out there yawning. Maybe they were out late last night. Maybe they had to get up early this morning. Maybe they just came from some place where you know, they were uh, not able to, to have the coffee that they would typically have in the morning. Who knows why they're yawning, right? But the meaning that I add to that based on my filters, my beliefs, my feelings about the world is that yawn must mean that that individual is bored and that I'm boring them with my presentation, right? And then I make assumptions about that data. Well, heck, if I'm boring that one person, then I'm probably boring everybody in the whole audience. And then I draw conclusions based on the assumptions I've made. I'm a terrible speaker. I should never have agreed to give this speech. And then I adopt beliefs based on those conclusions. So I begin to internalize that, right? I'm not just doing a terrible job with this particular speech, but I'm a bad speaker in general, and I really am just not a person. You know, some people should give presentations, some people shouldn't. Apparently, I'm in the latter category, right? And then I take action based on those beliefs. So beyond just thinking that I'm a terrible speaker, now I'm saying, you know what? I'm not going to accept any more speaking invitations because I don't want to bore any more whole huge rooms of people. Now, I want to highlight here that this is all reflexive, right? So once I've created those beliefs about myself, and I've taken actions based on those beliefs, it's all self-reinforcing. Because the only way I would get better as a speaker is to accept speaking invitations and to try to continue to practice those skills. But the action I'm taking now based on the beliefs I've adopted prevents me from further developing those skills. So that's a professional example maybe, but let's think about how this might work on the personal side. And I'll encourage you here to do this part on your own. So think about an interaction you've had that was particularly awkward where you walked away maybe feeling kind of icky about it, you walked away just feeling like for whatever reason that interaction just didn't quite go the way you want it to, and you have a feeling that the other person who was involved in the interaction walked away with a similar feeling. Now think about the observable data and experience that you had in that interaction. Think about the data that you selected from the whole array of observable data that you had. Think about the meanings that you added to those data, the assumptions and conclusions you drew, based on the meanings that you added to the data, think about the beliefs that you adopted, and think about the actions that you ultimately took. And then go a step further and try to apply that to the other individual who was involved in that interaction. What were their observable data and experiences? What data do you think they selected to fixate on? What meanings did they add? What assumptions did they make? What conclusions did they draw? 
and what beliefs ultimately did they assume and what did they take away from that particular interaction? What action might they take going forward based on that interaction? Now, think about that and reflect on the missed connection that existed in that interaction. Think about the fact that there was potentially an opportunity for genuine connection there that might have been meaningful to both of you, and that was missed, and it was probably missed because fundamentally your filters and values and beliefs were misaligned, and that created awkwardness in this interaction. So this is a great framework to apply when you find yourself in an interaction like that, and you have an opportunity to think through, first of all, what you might be doing to contribute to the awkwardness of the interaction, but also to try to put yourself in the other person's shoes and maybe help them fixate on different data, maybe give them different data uh, that they can use to, to change their interpretation of the experience. Uh, the other framework I'd like to touch on is a, is a way to think about trust. And when trust has been eroded between two individuals, it's like there's a wall between them. Uh, so thinking back to the ladder of inference, that wall may be built from assumptions, filters, and beliefs that each of you have that you've built up as this wall between the two of you. Uh, and a consulting group I've worked with in Seattle called uh, Teams and Leaders, which is a fantastic group I highly recommend, uh, use the analogy of a brick wall here. So if you want to remove a barrier, the, the conflict or lack of trust between you and some other individual that's represented in this analogy by this brick wall, how do you start? There's really only one way you can start, right? To take down a brick wall, which is you reach up and you take down one brick. And you have to be ready here when you start taking down bricks in this brick wall uh, because there's some anger on the other side of that wall and there may be some anger on your side and that wall that you've built up, you built up in part to protect you. And if you take down a brick and you create a hole in this wall, a gap in this wall, there's a good chance that the other person might throw something at you, figuratively of course. And this might look like you taking down a brick saying, look, I really screwed up in this situation and I wanna make this right. And the other person shouting back at you, yeah, you did, right? And at that point you have a choice. That might hurt a little bit and your reflexive response might be to put that brick right back up and protect yourself again, right? But, and if you do that, they won't be able to throw anything else at you. But that's not how you're gonna take down that brick wall. If you wanna take down the wall, if that's your ultimate goal to rebuild trust in that relationship by pulling down that brick wall that's between you, the only option you have in that situation to achieve that outcome is to reach up and to take down another brick. And humans, as it turns out, are really good at reciprocation, uh, which I was, suspect was what uh, Lao Tzu was getting at when he wrote that he who does not trust enough will not be trusted. And what are you doing really when you take down a brick? You're trusting the other individual. Trust is a verb, right? And so when you do that, you are making yourself vulnerable to that individual. And this is where the reciprocity comes in. Because when someone sees you trusting them and being vulnerable, they tend to reciprocate that trust right back at you. Uh, so there was an example of this in my career uh, when I was working on a redesign of the 777 skew, trailing edge skew detection system uh, where we were redesigning the system to use uh, rotary variable transducers instead of linear voltage differential transducers. Um, and we had created this system where to rig the new transducers in the factory, uh, the mechanics had to use this kind of 1960s piece of lab equipment called a phase angle voltmeter, and it really wasn't a production hardened solution. And we try really hard not to blame the mechanic, but in this case there clearly was a mechanic contribution. I, I personally witnessed where, you know, the suitcase sized piece of equipment would be all dialed in and all the little toggle switches flipped in just the right direction, and then uh, they would go to connect it to the airplane and they'd pull the cable that connected it to the airplane across the top of the box and flip all the toggle switches over. Uh, so there was an aspect of that, but fundamentally, we'd given the factory a solution that re wasn't ready for production. And in the midst of all this, I was actually working some triple shifts where I would be trying to solve the technical problem at my desk on my first shift during the day, and then going out in the evening to the factory where they were rigging airplanes in production and trying to help them rig the airplanes correctly in production. And then I was going out to the flight line to help the flight line re-rig airplanes that had been misrigged in production to get them ready for delivery to make sure we were ultimately giving a high quality product to our customer. And in the midst of all this, I got a meeting request from one of the factory superintendents asking us to come out during the day and, and have a meeting. And we just knew that the intent of this meeting 
was him wanting to make sure that we understood how much of an inconvenience this was for the factory and how much disruption we'd created. And my inclination initially was to go into this meeting ready for a fight. You know, here I was literally working around the clock trying to solve this problem. And this guy had the gall to, to make me walk away from my desk to, to actually go out to the factory so that he could basically yell at me about how inconvenient this was for him. And I still don't know exactly what flipped in my head during the walk out to the factory. Uh, but I walked into that room and the, the first thing out of my mouth was, uh, I am so sorry. I, I know this is incredibly disruptive. Uh, we're feeling terrible about releasing this change to the factory without the appropriate production hardening in place. Uh, we understand how disruptive it is and, and we're working as hard as we can to try to get it fixed and we're just so apologetic for the impact that this is having. And I didn't necessarily have the, the words, the ideas to understand this at, a, at the time, but in retrospect, what I was really doing was taking down a break. And the entire mode of the room changed. There was this element of reciprocity Right, where we all went in ready for the fight, and as soon as I took down a brick, as soon as I demonstrated my vulnerability and my openness to the conversation, you could watch everybody's shoulders drop a couple inches, and the tone of the conversation became, rather than being uh, controversial, rather than being uh, contentious, the tone of the conversation became about how we could get in partnership and try to help each other to minimize the impact and ultimately to solve this problem. And I came out of this uh, with a stronger relationship with that individual. And actually, a couple years later, uh, we had a different problem where we were trying to figure out how to handle something with the factory. And I got an email from him that burned into my brain because it literally said, I've worked with you before and your credibility precedes you. And he went on to say, basically, do whatever you think is the right thing in this situation and the factory will get on board with it. And that, to me, really demonstrated the tangible impact that, that something like this individual behavior of taking down a brick can help you get back into a trust relationship with that individual that can not only be personally fulfilling, but that can have positive business results for you and your company down the line. So when you're in a position where trust has been lost, think about the brick wall and think about whether you are in a position where you want to take down the brick wall. And if you do want to take down the brick wall, Really the only course of action that's available to you to start the process of taking down that brick wall is to reach up and to take down a brick. So think to yourself as an engineer, as a leader in that situation, what does it mean, what would it look like in this situation for me to take down a brick? Now if you go back to watch that video, the millennial question from Simon Sinek that I referenced earlier in my presentation you'll hear him say some really troubling things about the individuals, the people entering the workforce these days. And, you know, he reflects on the challenges that people have coming out of school, and frankly, what boils down a lot to a lack of trust, a lack of comfort with challenging situations and interpersonal interactions that are creating challenges in the workforce. And a lot of that boils down fundamentally to some of the things we've talked about here in the framework of emotional intelligence. And luckily, just by attending this session, you've demonstrated your commitment to start developing these skills and to uh, better prepare yourself to be successful in the workforce and to continue to grow these skills throughout the remainder of your career to continue to become increasingly successful throughout your career. So hopefully this explanation here, albeit fairly short and fairly shallow, has piqued your interest in emotional intelligence and hopefully you're inspired to continue to learn about and develop your own emotional intelligence. After the conclusion, I'll show a list of a few references you can explore for a deeper dive into many of the concepts I've talked about. And as I said up front, I want to stress that this is a skill set that isn't a destination, right? It's not like you get to a point and go, hooray, I'm emotionally intelligent, I can be done with this. This is a skill that you continue to build and build on throughout your entire careers and your entire lives. Emotional intelligence is not a destination, it's a lifetime commitment, but it's worth it.